Nancy Lokes from Families Outside again. Um, just wanted to add to the point that we made previously about the use of child impact assessments um, at the court stage. I think there's great value in using it at later stages as well for decisions in preparation for release, um, whether that's for home leave release on electronic tag, um, the actual release or um, the supervision on parole. Um, the family needs to be involved in these um, discussions as early as possible so they can identify what risks there might be to themselves and to the children um, and what difficulties there might be in any kind of resettlement. I think there's an assumption that we find that families think that once a person is released, everything's going to be fine. Um, but certainly it's not always the case and not often the case, especially if someone has been in prison for a long time. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Uh, you okay? Um, in Aksha again from Hak Center for Child Rights. I wanted to pick up on Madame's point because it is very important to remember that there are there are parents in prison who ha may have been there because there was violence against the family. So how would what the question? I I don't have an answer, but it I would like to make a point of a question on this. Um, for example, if the father is in prison for having mu uh, murdered a mother, the mother, um, what is what would be in the best interest of the child once the father is out? Um, you know, questions like those have to be also addressed, and we may not have answers here today just now, but definitely may need to be included and as madame pointed out it the father the pair, father for example could be in prison because of incest um, and there may be no mother then what happens to the child when the father comes out of prison so those are very very sort of uh, delicate and and questions where the child's very protection is at stake so what how would we decide on the best interest of the child in those cases thank you Thank you. In fact, these uh, matters already been uh, researched and have a very clear solution. Anyhow, it's not our time to discuss about this in detail. Anyhow, this is the principle that we should include in our con uh, uh, how say recommendation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Could I just follow up the last point? Peter Wedge, uh, I'm a retired academic from the UK. The, the last point was, uh, which I've now lost, so I'll come back to you in a minute. <laughs> Who will take his turn first? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your tolerance. <coughs> Well, the point really is, I think, that we cannot expect sitting here or even out in the community to solve all of these problems. Some of them are intractable. Children have been messed about by their parents, by their parents' behavior. If their father has murdered their mother, that is a desperately difficult situation for any child to cope with and for anyone trying to help that child to cope with. These are extreme situations. They're very difficult. We cannot ignore them. But there are much, much bigger problems in terms of the numbers of children who are affected by much more uh, soluble problems than those. And I hope we will ensure that we devote most of our time to problems which we can see can be solved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You would like to... Okay. I wanted to make a general question. I think that very little has been said about arrests in the home. Uh, in other words, the possibility where especially mothers can have house arrest, uh, uh, in other words, fulfill their sentence whilst taking care of their children in a sort of a house arrest situation. In my country, there is a law that allows for this for some years now. And although it is a situation that is much better than detention in a prison, after years, we have seen many problems associated with it, with uh, 
house arrest. I leave the question open for other colleagues, and I'm wondering whether in their countries they have some sort of experience in this area and whether they uh, can say that there's there have been good results. I'm sorry for taking a step backwards, but it has come to my attention that very little has actually been said about this. Thank you. I'm going back to the point that was made about these difficult situations where there may be danger for the child returning. I think if we stick to the best interests of the child in a case-by-case -case assessment, we'll, we'll be quite uh, sure that we can make the right decisions on that. So it's just making sure that when those decisions about release are made, that, that the actual circumstances of the case are considered in, in each and every one, uh, and an appropriate decision made. So I think what we, what we don't want is a recommendation that says children must never be returned to a parent who has murdered the partner. It should be that in each case we should make a case-by-case -case decision based on the best interest of the child, taking also into consideration the views of the child. Thank you. It's, uh, it should rely on the conditions of that particular case. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, you first, and you after, please. Deborah Cowley, Action for Prisoners' Families. Um, Often um, we have found that uh, the adults concerned have very unrealistic ideas uh, about what release will be like. Um, we have um, a program, well prob I'm sure we have more than one, but I've got one in mind now at the moment, um, where um, a prisoner's partner can go into prison uh, and take part in a program where they think about the implications of uh, resettlement and how it will work in practice for them. And this includes um, financial considerations as well as emotional ones. Um, and also, um, we have produced um, uh, actually two uh, um, DVDs which are dramas um, about uh, resettlement issues. Uh, and these have been very powerful when they've been shown to um, prisoners because they are often very surprised that their families are worried about the release and believe that everything will be easy. Sorry, uh, Lucy Gamble from Eurochips, following on from um, uh, Deborah's points. Um, I think one of the issues that is extremely difficult for families is actually knowing how to plan and prepare for release. I think we have to remember, I mean, in the UK, something like 15% of our prisoners are on indeterminate sentences, which means they have no specified release date. And, and that makes it extremely difficult for anybody working with children to know how to prepare them for the release. And once the release is authorized, the person can be coming home next week with very, very little time, therefore, for, for adequate preparation to, to you know, take place. So I think part of all of the, uh, what needs to be done is, is really key support by um, organization services post-release. Uh, many countries have a probation service that will have some engagement depending on the type of sentence, but they may well have some engagement, particularly with the prisoner, which will include certain restrictions if there's a child protection issue, but they can also help to support the family but I think we need to pay much, much more attention to support for children and the whole family in the really critical period post-release. Coming back to the question that Oliver uh, asked, I think the, the issue about um, post-release success um, really raises a lot of the issues. Um, that are faced by prisoners on or m many of the barriers that prisoners face on release to uh, what's called I guess successful reintegration um, which can include things like uh, extremely challenging parole or probation conditions, um, criminal records that prevent them from um, from finding and keeping work, um, mental health and, and concerns and addictions that may have been exacerbated um, while they were in prison. Um, all of these can lead to them failing to contribute financially um, or, or socially upon their release or even or um, being a further burden financially to their to their families which may already have been overburdened by the many costs that we've spoken of both uh, you know directly from loss of income but also you know what I think 
I, w I would like to have mentioned before is really direct cost to families, which of course children bear the brunt of things like, um, I'll say it again, uh, the cost of uh, uh, being transported to prison, the cost of phone calls, the amount of money, food, gifts that many families are sending in to prisoners, which have can in some cases uh, in the States and in, in other countries um, be a significant cost for families. And of course, we know that uh, when families are poor, this is borne by children. Thank you. Okay. You. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Tears. Um, I just want to mention, actually, that in, 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 in uh, Asian countries with, with, with very, very long uh, prison sentences, honestly speaking, I never saw uh, maybe one out of 100 family unification works out, actually, and it really doesn't work. I mean, there are loyalty conflicts with the children. There are The children look so much forward to see the parents again. The parent has been too long in prison. They, they are totally stranger in the world. They, they don't have an income. There are no placement programs. The children look forward that the parent comes back, but they have to start caring of, uh, uh, for the parent instead. And so, and it's, it's, it's a very frustrating procedure because you see them looking forward to it. And at the end, they, 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 are, they are very unhappy at and, and they cannot take care. Nobody can take care of anybody anymore. It's, uh, most of the time, it's a total failure. Almost, always. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who would like to get the floor? Okay. Yes, uh, the lady on this side first, and you have that, okay? Uh, Susan, Susan Ellis, HMP Park in the UK. Um, as part of all our programs, we work with all the families to work towards release, and the partners and children come in, and we work towards setting a smart target with them where they look at different aspects of what might be a problem from finance, addiction, even the way they're thinking from the partner's point of view and from the prisoners because they might not see it as the same problem. But we also look at what the children want and we look at their hopes and fears and it can be anything from, as the children have expressed in the past, that they'll have to take the Xbox off the large television and put it in their bedroom to something like father might go back to his old ways or they'll start arguing and we try to help them resolve as many of those problems as we can and to help them set up a family first aid kit which will help them if the problems arise and make sure that they've got support. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, do you would like to? Hi, just to pick up on that, um, I think it's really important that there be protocol in place that really addresses the needs of the children uh, before release to make sure that the needs of the children are addressed in all the release planning, all the reintegration planning, and that there's a continuum of care after the release happens as well. Um, we do uh, family group decision making, which really assesses the needs and the strengths of the families, um, which obviously provides support to the children as well. Thank you. Nancy Lokes from Families Outside. I'm actually going to pick on one of my colleagues here because I think it's an example of very good practice in Scotland, um, an organization called Circle, which actually works with um, the prisoners in custody but supports the family outside at the same time and then continues to work with the families after release. Marina, can I ask you to say something about it? Hello, as Nancy has introduced me uh, already, uh, it's not really necessary to say my name or organization, but for the sake of clarity, I will. My name is Marina Shaw. I work with an organization called Circle. My background is both law and social work, and unfortunately, I've worked in statutory sector prisons and in the social work sector. And of course, the emphasis then is on the duty to both you know, to uh, prosecute people and to punish them. Now, the fact of the matter is, a, a chap earlier spoke about the need to actually focus on rehabilitation. And when I bid to do that, I actually moved into the sector in order to help rehabilitation. And I find that in the voluntary sector, which, which is where I'm now placed, we managed to bring uh, to bear a brand new, unique kind of way of working, and that's using our knowledge, as a big team of us work across central Scotland, and we start our work in the prison. We support the woman while she's in prison, we support the family on the outside, and then we support the women, when, or, and indeed now men, because I'm... 
Microphone, please. Mike didn't like his accent. Uh, the other ones come on. Uh, <laughs> right. Hi, we support the um, family on the, the outside. Some of the support lasts for about a year, but we work in the family's homes. That's a crucial factor. Nobody comes to our bases. We work in, in, oh, in the homes where the problems are, and we help in that process of rehabilitation. Somebody earlier mentioned about which particular groups that are at a disadvantage. I would suggest groups that are affected by poverty are at a particular disadvantage. They're the ones that f uh, fill our prisons, and it's actually helping them very often cope with intergenerational behaviour and offending. So trying to, you know, we work in their homes to help that turn around so that they are able to continue to parent their children in a meaningful fashion, the way they want to parent them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, oh. Please, please. Uh, thank you. I am Lia Sacerdote from Italy, a member of uh, Eurochips. We work uh, in uh, Milan, especially Milan, in the free prison of Milan, and we have a program for children, for imprisoned parents, for their families. We work uh, uh, from 10 years, and uh, I would say, a, a, from our experience, a, a very simple thing that uh, can uh, be too simple, perhaps. But in Italy, there are uh, innovative laws that uh, uh, say that uh, mother must not be incarcerated uh, only when they are dangerous. And uh, in these years, uh, 10 years, uh, the uh, situation is not changed, and uh, they are always dangerous, so they are always incarcerated. So uh, uh, I, I, I think that it's in, there is an important uh, uh, matter, a cultural matter, and uh, I, um, I think that uh, a, a me meeting, an important meeting uh, like ours uh, can say um, that we uh, must choose children and uh, not prison. So uh, I would underline that uh, this matter is important uh, without ambivalence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I totally agree, totally agree that uh, we should apply for social and health measures just to rehabilitate the, uh, the parents who commit the crimes rather than put them in jail. We, we should be first priority. Anyhow, who else would like to get the floor? Okay, please. Microphone, please. I don't think my mic's working. It is now. Okay, right. While we continue to play an emphasis, put an emphasis on prosecuting and punishing people, that actually costs the state millions, and they do it in the public's name. The fact of the matter is it costs many more millions for people to go into prison and come back out and try to recover from that. There would, it would actually be a greater investment in our name if we tried to rehabilitate prior to imprisonment, during imprisonment, and post-imprisonment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who else? <laughs> Okay, please. Um, following up on something which was said this morning, I would like to make, well, I'm Kirsten Sandberg from the Committee on the Rights of the Child. I would like to make a comment on 
on how the committee can work with this because I think this morning maybe we might have given the impression that it's uh, difficult to work with children of incarcerated parents as a group because there's so much work to do but uh, I think what we mean is that we might not single it out as a group in the concluding observations but we can put the, the, the questions to the states under uh, different articles, uh, family life, uh, protection of children, the right to be heard, the best interests and so on, concerning this group. So uh, what was said this morning doesn't mean that we're not going to look into the situation of these children. We can ask, we, we need the, the uh, information in the state reports, we need it from the, from the NGOs, from you. Uh, and we can ask questions and put things into the concluding observations about this. Of course, then, then based on the general recommendations from this day. So thank you a lot for all the input you are giving. This is not meant as a concluding statement, but it's just <laughs> since nobody else asked for the floor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Oliver Robertson, uh, thank you all very much for the comments so far. Just in the short time we have left, for the substantive discussion before we start to think more about particular recommendations that we want to take back. Um, there are a number of outstanding issues which it may be useful to have some brief discussion on. Um, one which was discussed a little but not resolved was the role of the media and what should or should not be said about um, the involvement of parents in the criminal justice system within the media, what the media should or should not say about that. Um, we talked some, something about the data available and the data that is needed. Um, more widely, um, there was a question about what research is needed, which areas are there gaps in what we know about and we'd need to find out more. There was also a discussion um, briefly about older children, teenagers, and any particular issues or needs relating to them. If, th if you have anything to say about those or other issues which you feel haven't been covered adequately, um, please say them. There was a question, did I say resources? I did not say resources. <laughs> would like to respond to these questions. Please. Deanne uh, from the U.S. Um, regarding the, the media, um, I just have come off a very um, heinous case in which um, a man murdered several police officers in another state and the man's nephew had the very same name. And because it was all throughout the national media and um, maybe even the international media, I had this very uh, bewildered and taunted and ostracized nephew who actually loved his uncle very much. But I mean, for the life of me, I wanted to erase the fact that the name was used because it, it did mean a burden on this child that he, he didn't deserve and he had no right to bear. I don't know, have a resolution. I just know that it's an incredibly painful, wounding thing that children have to endure. And even if it's not a name you share, you know, it, it, it's somebody you love and um, it comes back to you in many ways. So I have no recommendation. I don't want to do away with the freedom of the press, but um, they do need to be aware of, of its impact. This is the rise of privacy of the child. Then no problem. We have to make a strong recommendation. Okay. Uh, we'll take the floor. Okay, please. Maya Gabelica Shuplika from the Office of Ombudsman for Children Croatia. Uh, well, from my point of view, the media people can be uh, good guys and bad guys and can be very useful in rising awareness of the phenomenon. 
uh, not to reveal and to exposure the child problem and the particular case, but to talk about phenomenon. Uh, on the other case, there can uh, make a big damage uh, in according to privacy or uh, involving in process revealing uh, some informations. Well, our uh, experience is that there are some mechanisms uh, on which they react. Well, there are, uh, uh, in Croatia, I, I, I uh, think that in other countries as well, there is a uh, uh, ethical body uh, in, in um, well, the journalist ethical media ethical body, and uh, we, uh, we warn them in every case uh, when we see, well, the jeopardize uh, uh, privacy of, of children, and they react. They uh, reveal this in their, uh, their newspapers, and the uh, public knows about this. I think it is a kind of the work of the responsibility of media, uh, and using their positive capacity and uh, diminish and the, the to make small uh, bad capacity or bad influence. Thank you. I have a quite different point to make, Sabine Skuta, um, German Red Cross and National Coalition in Germany. Um, this is the point of the uh, st structure of states which, are, which is federal. We had in Germany, we had a uh, rather unsatisfactory um, experience. One of the opposition parties made on this issue a question to German government, and the answer was uh, more or less, uh, this is not our responsibility, it is the responsibility of the lender. Uh, this is the regions in, in the provinces in Germany. And uh, I would uh, ask uh, the Commission to take into consideration to make a remark on the responsibility of states in this, uh, for this issue especially, for the issue of ch the rights of children of, uh, of prisoners. Thank you. Uh, we be like this. This lady first. Alan? And you, okay. Just a quick response to Oliver's question about what kind of research is needed. I think we can all agree that a, a great deal of research is needed. And um, uh, I would point to um, Joseph Murray's excellent um, collaboration at, at, at AL, the Campbell collaboration, which um, systemically reviewed the um, outcomes, uh, quality research into the outcomes of um, of children of prisoners attempting to tease apart the um, many associated factors. Um, he strong, or uh, that research group strongly suggests, and I think um, many of us would agree that large-scale longitudinal study um, that specifically designed to study the outcomes, um, the independent outcomes um, for children um, of incarcerated parents, um, research that's designed to be able to tease apart all the um, associated risk factors. Um, such as parental criminality and, and to control for them. Um, certainly qualitative research is also needed to better understand children's uh, experiences and points of view. Um, specifically, protective factors that um, save some children from many of the negative outcomes. Uh, what is it um, uh, that makes uh, the outcome so variable for children um, and evaluations of the many programs that we've uh, seen today not just in short-term outputs but long-term outcomes and then I would also just uh, uh, certainly strongly reiterate P uh, Peter's uh, point um, that we need all prison services uh, to collect basic data. If they can collect extensive mental health histories on everyone who comes in the door, then certainly they can ask, uh, what are the ages of your children? It's Elsa Knutsen from LSE. Alan Kikuchi White for SOS Children's <coughs> Villages International again. Um, I just want to make a comment about children and youth, and youth in particular, and youth participation obviously and quite correctly throughout the day participation the participation of children and families has been a central theme to everything we've been discussing but perhaps we need recommendations to take that to the next level with regards to policy change 
um, both as NGOs and calling on governments to work with youth, to work with youth groups in developing campaigns, peer-to-peer -peer research, any projects that bring the voices of young people with these experiences to the fore in policy making, both in terms of what we lobby for and what we actually want changed. Thank you. The, uh, the lady at the back of the door first, uh, the back of the balloon first, and, and you come after. Um, Virginia Murillo. Virginia Murillo. I also wanted to touch upon the communication media, which, as we say, there are good and bad practices therein. Unfortunately, there are very serious cases with misuse of uh, images of children, which, of course, uh, has an impact on the integrity and the uh, privacy of the children, uh, dissemination of data which shouldn't be made public. But there is also case law which does show how, uh, based on the use of the Articles of the Convention, states can punish and uh, call the attention of the media. For example, in my uh, country, the uh, this has played a really important role in regulating the media on this. There are also experiences, uh, uh, for example, in Latin America. There's a Latin American platform of communication agencies for journalists and uh, NGOs and uh, d rights defenders in monitoring the written and televised press. Um, there are uh, they award journalists that uh, do good work. They they are a reliable source of information uh, for information on childrens and children and adolescents, and they're uh, reliable sources. I think it's very important in the case of the Committee on the Rights of the Child that it convene a general day discussion f regarding the media and regarding the right uh, updated rights of the child. I think uh, in for example, like we did in 2001, and perhaps this could lead to a general comment which would perhaps appropriately regulate the use of uh, media and the role of the media. Uh, in order to prevent them uh, criminalizing uh, children in various cases. Deborah Cowley, Action for Prisoners' Families. Um, a quick comment on um, adolescent uh, children of uh, incarcerated parents. Um, in addition to um, making sure that we hear their voice and that they're properly represented, in um, a study uh, that uh, we carried out some time ago, um, two of the things they said was that um, because adolescents are in the process, I mean, what, what, their major life task at that time is separating from their parents. Uh, what they said was that they wanted um, someone independent to talk to uh, about their feelings and um, issues that they have. Uh, and they also um, wanted to be independently informed about um, matters concerning their um, imprisoned parent. You first, and the lady up there. Thank you, Chairman. Jan Wetzel, Amnesty International. Following up on the question of media involvement and the statement that we just heard on uh, Latin America, uh, if, if the committee uh, allows, I would just like to uh, refer you to, uh, uh, to, to the regional standards under the European Convention on Human Rights, which uh, uh, there's a long uh, list of, of case law authorities trying to balance the rights to privacy and the right to to media uh, uh, freedom and generally the, ca the cases have all come down. If there's a child involved or the rights of children are involved, uh, the cases generally come down on the side of privacy. So if, if you uh, are willing to accept regional authorities, you, you will find uh, uh, fruitful areas there. Thank you. Amanda Swallow, University of Huddersfield. Uh, as regard to uh, gaps in research, uh, you could uh, children who've been placed into care as a result of their parents' imprisonment are predominantly the uh, 
children of prisoners are referred to as invisible. These appear to be invisible of invisible and are very difficult to secure interview with. Um, although anecdotal evidence uh, suggests good practice in maintaining contact, uh, it's not consistent throughout the UK and uh, nor mandatory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, please. <coughs> Lucy Gamble from Euroships. I just want to make a very brief point, which is uh, to the Commission in terms of when it makes its final uh, uh, recommendations. We've been talking about children of prisoners today, but actually I would urge you to talk about children, uh, as indeed the example from the United States, children with a prisoner in the family or children affected by imprisonment. Uh, it's a particularly big thing with teenagers, but the effect of having a sibling in prison, a grandparent in prison, or wider family members, it is not confined. Negative impact on children is not confined to just having a parent in prison. Okay, I, I suppose that we can get uh, many good ideas, opinion, input. But anyhow, uh, if anybody would like to propose the recommendation which have not been raised or round up our uh, meetings today, please feel free to do. Okay. Suppose. I don't suppose anyone <laughs> will uh, pick up anything else. So I, I, I think that uh, maybe I ask my colleague to blow up. Uh, Oliver Robertson, thank you. Um, at this stage, um, we want to make sure, we want to move towards um, wrapping up so we're going to finish the substantive discussion at this stage however there is still time um, to make recommendations to say particular specific things that you think it is important the committee are aware of the committee pronounce on and that should be take and that should form part of either the oral report back which will happen a little later or more importantly the later written report which the committee will produce out of this day of general discussion and which will include um, the recommendations. So any specific recommendations people have they think should be included, please say these for the next 15 minutes until we wrap up. Um, I, in Akshi Ganguly, Hak Center for Child Rights, I would urge the committee to very specifically talk about, I'm just reiterating some of the points. One is the protocols for the for the judiciary as well as the police i would urge the committee to uh, put forward recommendations on standards of care and protection for children who are outside of the prison and and their parents are in there and therefore are extremely vulnerable to exploitation and abuse uh, you know most of them would have dropped out of school become child laborers or got into streets um, how what are the standards of care and protection that we and therefore second third following that is what are the monitoring mechanisms that we have for them to ensure their rehabilitation and their ongoing care and protection that's